grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to worship this morning at Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Today, as you may know, uh, may be able to note from your bulletin covers a very Presbyterian Sunday. Following our worship service this morning, we're having our congregational meeting. So get comfortable because we'll invite you to stick around after for the meeting. You're also, of course, invited afterwards to uh, join us in the fellowship hall for refreshments provided by the personnel committee. We hope that you take that opportunity to learn a little bit more about this congregation and to catch up with one another. We believe that our fellowship and friendship here at Lakeside is one of the best parts about worshiping together in this place. And now the children will lead us into worshiping God. Happy are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. who never do any wrong, but always walk in your ways. You lay down your commandments, that we should Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. I will thank you with an unfeigned heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. Let us worship God. God offers grace. Let us seek that grace as we pray together. Holy God, we confess that we bow down before other gods. We have turned our hearts away from you. Our worship of work and devotion to consumerism disorders our love of you and each other. Forgive us, God, and mend what is broken that we may be one with you. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives our sin Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please pray with me. Loving God, anoint us with your Holy Spirit as we hear your word this day. Fill us with your truth that we may walk in the ways of God and to the glory of your realm. Amen. Our first reading today is from Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous 
and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. See if you can put these words into context. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, or Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic. We have confidence that periods of time have marked the significant changes in our world for many, many, many years. Some of the words I just uttered I found in a book that I read to my children when they were very small as they wanted to make friends with the idea of dinosaurs and the different periods in which the dinosaurs lived and then stopped living. Later on in a geology classroom, some of those other words came to the fore, explaining stuff that we just have to imagine. We see signs of it. With what words shall we identify the periods of time which mark the significant changes in how God's people have understood God? and in particular how the scriptures change from this to that to another era. The Bible in front of you in the pews, if you opened it to the first page, says, in the beginning when God created. The Hebrew makes it clear this is a book about God. And what we know about this God, when God began the creation that we continue to experience. From the very beginning, this God had purpose. This God had a nature visible in the very creation itself. But there's another period of scripture which begins with the story of Abram. 
Abram and Sarai were called from their ancestral home to a promised land. And then their son Isaac, and then Jacob and Jacob's sons saved by moving to Egypt. And then Moses led them out of Egypt, out of slavery, restoring the promise and the land and adding the covenant law. And then perhaps another period is David uniting tribes into a kingdom and Solomon building a temple. But that ushered in the time of the prophets in response to God's people turning away from God. The law was meant to draw them near, but life and prosperity and the gift of a promised land led to wayward attentions and conflicting behaviors. God sent prophets to call God's people back from Elijah to Isaiah, from Jeremiah to Malachi. And then finally, finally, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus lived and taught. He healed. He loved. He gave his life on the cross and was raised from the dead. And from that experience sprung up the church, filled with Holy Spirit, the fullness of God revealed, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. So when we think of the periods in the history of the planet, we study what triggered the transitions. We discover catastrophic, catastrophic events. Perhaps a meteor strike so changed the atmosphere that all the dinosaurs were destroyed and only after long recovery did new life spring up. The transitions visible in biblical time are similarly accompanied by radical shifts in the way of God and God's people. The creation and prehistory stories, for example, turn on the tale of Noah and the flood, the ark, and the rainbow. Before and after those moments are decidedly different, and we from the future look back and recognize a turning point. Today's Old Testament reading records such a moment in the great expanse of stories which build upon God's actively taking God's people by the hand and leading them from slavery in Egypt. Moses, the Lord's prophet Moses, He's the intermary, intermediary ex responsible for translating the word of the Lord into a specific response of God's people. And yet, Moses himself was flawed. And the Bible carefully notes his mistakes, his reluctance. And it keeps the focus on God. God alone is holy. God alone is mighty. The Lord God saves them from slavery, but the people are skeptical. The Lord appears to Moses and gives them a law and shapes expectations for their living in covenantal codes with remarkable clarity. But in today's reading, Moses is near the end of his days. The sojourn in the wilderness includes great drama involving God's presence among God's people as they come to the brink of the promised land, which Moses himself will not see with him. Moses calls the people together one last time. He says, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances. Then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. The point is that our relationship with God at moments comes to the simple choice. Yes, no. Turning one way or the other. God's promise fulfilled, calling for our clear response. Moses gathered all the people. 
The opportunity to say yes was not limited to just one tribe or the leadership team or just part of the crowd. Moses offered life and prosperity as God offers that to us in every generation. But related to life and prosperity is the rest of the covenant, the way of the Lord, the commandments, the decrees, the ordinances. If you know your scriptures, you know that a generation later, Joshua had roughly the same experience, gathered all the people together again, just as his mentor had done. And he, simply, he similarly put before God's people a choice. At the end of the story of Joshua, God's people are all gathered and asked to indicate with their lives their yes to the Lord. Joshua sweetened the invitation. He says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In other words, I would suggest you do the same. There was no question about which way Joshua would go. But what about God's people? And then further along, the story of Elijah has a similar moment. Do you remember when Elijah was told by God to challenge the prophets of Baal? God's people had turned away from God and were chasing after other gods, even though they were not gods, as the scripture reminds us. But Elijah is summoned by God and called upon to challenge the prophets of Baal to a duel. There would be two altars, two piles of wood, two bowls to be sacrificed. And whoever rains fire down from heaven thus demonstrates whose God is truly God. And you guys go first. In the midst of speaking to God's people after the prophets of Baal had failed, Elijah says to the people, how long will you go limping with two opinions? If the Lord God is your God, say so, and live as if that were the case. When we come to the baptismal font, we soften the question a bit. When the parents of an infant or the adult being baptized are asked to choose, surrounded by the community of faith, just as in the moments described so long ago. The question we put is, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? That question about turning away from then is followed by turning to Jesus Christ, saying yes. The vocabulary of turning to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior emerges only after a choice is required. Very similar to that in the time of Moses. In the ancient period of Scripture, the Lord banishes Adam and Eve from the garden. He saves only Noah and his family and divides the world into nations and tongues after the Tower of Babel. In the era of the Law of Moses, it's clearly stated that the sins of one generation will be visited upon the third and the fourth. But as we keep moving forward in the Old Testament, we find ourselves coming to a place where the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the children. And then each one will be held accountable for their own. And then finally, as early as the prophet Jeremiah, a new covenant comes into view. The Lord will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Jesus changes everything, and yet the call to choose is still there. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we don't know what behaviors on their part and what questions from them triggered his writing, but we see clearly his summary of how he approached them. He was writing to a people he loved in a church he helped to found, and yet divisions had emerged, and Paul in this letter muses about the nature of his witness to them. He wrote, And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling, 
Are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? The periods of Scripture are distinct, but the abiding message is unchanged in every age. We are called to respond to God's promise fulfilled in creation, redemption, in covenant love, and most completely in Jesus Christ. The foundation of our response is a choice, not unlike coming to a fork in the road. What was it that Yogi Berra once said? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Hmm. Well, Robert Frost was more poetic. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The details of the choice change in each successive era, but the essential principle is unchanged. Say yes to God, and then spend the rest of your life understanding what that means as you deepen your relationship with the Almighty as you love your neighbor, as you love yourself. Keep it simple. Let us pray. Loving God, we respond to all that you have done in every age, to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the ways in which our decision to worship, to follow, to be your faithful ones is renewed again and again. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As Peggy said, the meeting begins immediately after the organ postlude. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.